meet in order and the Calibor, Calibor School Boards uh, of Directors um, and it is about uh, 2.15. Um, first of all, make sure we have a quorum. Um, okay. uh, Tony Adams? Here. Jennifer Moses? Here. Jonathan Mariner? Here. Ron Beller? Here. Dr. Jose Lopez? Here. Carolyn Hack? Here. Pete Brigger? He was not going to join us. Okay. Robin DeGracia? Here. Dr. Margaret Harris? No. Margaret said that she wouldn't be here later. Okay, thank you. Good. So we have a forum. And first thing we want to do is review the agenda, and I want to accept uh, Jen's uh, suggestion that we then move up uh, um, items. Excuse me, can you please wait because the general interpretation is not ready? Oh, okay, sure. Please, thank you. Yes, I did. Thank you very much for offering. <laughs>
Uh, I'm the mother of a student at the Academy. Uh, esta reunión del board fue muy complicada para saber dónde y cuándo iba a
Lanfoya. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mar Maria Lanfoya. Yo soy miembro de la comunidad de Richmond. I am a member of the Richmond community. Este, but yo estoy aquí porque pues me involucro mucho este en la educación uh, de mi de mi comunidad. I'm here because I like to be involved in the education system of my community. Este, cuando venimos aquí um, hoy este día, como dijo Alessa, no lo voy a repetir porque es obvio que ella les dijo de que la consistencia que ustedes tienen que tener y no violando el el la acta de Brown, este, ustedes tienen que ser consistente en lo que está diciendo um, la justicia para tener estas estas reuniones. Uh, the announcements of these board meetings so that we don't uh, go against Brown Act laws and keep straight consistency for the parents. Este, porque si ustedes ven cuántos papás ustedes tienen de aquí de Caliber, Richmond, Caliber, um, aquí Change Maker de Vallejo. Because if you guys see how many parents do you have from CMA and then from the Academy. Entonces es importante que la familia sepa que existen estas reuniones donde están haciendo decisiones que impactan a nuestra educación de nuestra comunidad, tanto en Richmond como en Vallejo. And it's important for the parents to be a part of these discussions that impact the whole community, their community's education. Este, una de mis sugerencias que les quisiera pedir es que si ustedes tienen nombres um, en, 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 como un marquito y con las posiciones que ustedes representan. Uh, one request I have is if we can have the same tags from now on with your name and what position you hold on the board, that would be great. Ustedes son, no representan uh, pues, a la familia de las escuelas de Caliber. Yo antes pertenecía a Caliber, ya no, pero eso no significa que no me interesa lo que, lo que están haciendo. Para mí es muy importante que las promesas que las escuelas charters, especialmente Caliber, prometió a las familias, no solo se quedan marcadas en un papel. Um, I used to be a part of the Caliber community, unfortunately that's not the case anymore. However, it doesn't mean that I don't care about the community's uh, like, uh, educational system, and I think that it's important that Caliber meets the promises that they made to parents and that it's not just something that's on paper. Entonces, uh, me gustaría um, también que promu promuevan estas reuniones uh, para que los papás estén más involucrados, porque una de las cosas que a mí me, me intriga este, es que para unas reuniones sí quieren a los papás y para otras no. Entonces, aquí es donde se hacen decisiones. I also think that it's important that uh, the board makes more of an effort to voice and like uh, relay these meeting dates to parents because it's interesting to me how there's certain meetings where like the front staff or the board really pushes for parent involvement and however that like others there's no like effort to get parent involvement. Entonces cuando viene las, uh, el tiempo de renovar la petición de los cinco años, muchas familias son requeridas que vayan, pero no están haciendo el esfuerzo suficiente para que los papás entiendan que las mesas directivas del distrito del condado solo les dieron el permiso, pero donde realmente hacen las decisiones es aquí. Because when it comes time to renew the five-year charter, there's a lot of effort to relay parents' involvement. However, there's not that same relay here. When there's not an effort placed into making parents understand that the state, like the the county board just gave you permission to keep your charter, but the real decisions are made here in these board meetings, and that needs to be related to parents more. Y lamentablemente no solo ustedes, la Caliber hace esto, todas las charters lo hacen. And unfortunately it's not only Caliber who does this, it's all charters. Ahorita yo estoy en otra escuela y es lo mismo. Entonces, ¿cómo podemos educarnos que los papás? Nosotros estamos aquí porque estamos buscando una educación de calidad, pero eso se ha perdido porque esto se ve como más un negocio que realmente una educación. Uh, I'm currently a part of another school and it's the same thing and unfortunately uh, there's a miscommunication and quality education has been lost. Entonces hagamos un esfuerzo para trabajar juntos. Este, yo como comunidad, pero tienen padres que están muy involucrados, entonces um, es muy importante que ustedes tengan consistencia 
um, que involucren más a los padres, porque ustedes no conocen a muchos papás, no conocen a los administradores, no, no conocen, solo lo ven en papel, los de la mesa directiva. Uh, and I believe there needs to be more of an effort made to relay parents into these informative meetings because you represent us, however, like you don't know a lot of parents and you don't know the front administrative staff, so that's important to get more involvement with the schools. Y, y solo dan información en papel. And you guys only receive information on paper, like you don't, you're not in person to what's going on and affecting our families. Y otra recomendación que les daría es que sus directores estuvieran aquí sentados para que realmente ellos vean lo que está pasando, porque yo sé que ellos tienen mucho que hacer, pero estas reuniones son importantes porque aquí es donde se están tomando decisiones que afectan a nuestros hijos, bien o mal. And I believe uh, it's important for uh, the principals of both schools to actually also be present in these meetings because these meetings affect both schools and both parents and it's important to have them involved in as well. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Solo quería agregar una cosita. Que por ejemplo, yo estaba preparada para venir. Yo estaba preparada para venir y tomar mi tiempo y escucharlos y darles mis opiniones. Pero ustedes al hacer tan largas cerrada, yo es hora de que me tengo que ir y entonces yo perdí mi oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes. Um, and one more thing, I came here and I wanted to be involved and participate in this meeting, but however the closed session take, took so long that now I have to leave and I can't be a part of this. If you could just be considerate of that when next, the next agenda that comes out. Gracias. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Gracias. Gracias. The board has to vote on a couple of motions. Right. Do you shift the Marcus go first? For the voting? It's already two thirds. For the voting part of that? Yeah. 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 If that's the, that only the time. Sorry, I didn't hear what the uh, proposal is. We have to. He's, he's yeah. asking to switch his part with Marcus's, so Marcus goes first because those are actions. Great. Right? Actions. Great. All right, I move to move A2 first and A1 second. Oh, yeah, that's right. A second. Uh, okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. We give up. Thank you for reminding me, Tony. Quick report of what we did in closed session to the public. You raised that? Okay. Uh, okay. Wanted to let the public know that we had an opportunity to uh, interview two uh, uh, candidates for the finals for the position of uh, chief of chief executive officer uh, in closed session, which is a personnel item, which is uh, allowable by the cloud and which is why we did that. Uh, we have one more on Thursday, which we're going to be doing via a video conference. And uh, soon thereafter, and I can't tell you exactly when, then the search committee will be determining a finalist. So we'll come back to you, we'll make public announcements, and we'll be making sure we communicate with parents and staff and school leaders.
Not live. It's just it'll be on YouTube. On YouTube, uh, what what uh, what station are you? With? My name, Don Gosney. Okay. So let if you want to just you know who you are and what position you are. Okay. Thank that. you very much. Yeah. <laughs> white on white. <laughs> All right. It's not the highest tech. <laughs> Sorry about that. Getting set up. Uh, so, for the camera credit, uh, I'm Marcus Markey, the Chief Operating Officer here at Caliber. Uh, and I wanted to give uh, an update on the three things today. One is the uh, finance update on uh, the finances for 2019 And then I wanted to talk a little bit about our budget planning for 2019. And then third, I want to talk about a couple of was around why it was lower than we had originally budgeted back in June. And you can see on the slide some of the details, uh, but the thing that I want to emphasize is that uh, in going back and looking at the conversations we had at the time, it was an intentional decision to enroll fewer students. The 
the second thing that there was a question about was about our lottery preferences. And while we don't want to make a specific recommendation at this point, I did want to mention that I am following up with this with Vallejo Unified in particular, and so far they've been receptive to the idea. Next few slides I'm going to skip over since they're in the packet. You can review them yourselves, but they just summarize the financials, which, as I've been saying, are not materially changed from our last meeting. Uh, the first item that I did want to bring for feedback and approval from the board is regarding our current. Currently, have a relationship with Heritage Bank of Commerce, and for a variety of reasons related to both our commercial accounts and our line of credit that we have with them, we are interested in a proposal that was included in the packet to switch to First Republic Bank. Um, having a yeah, go ahead. The finance committee discussed those reasons why the. Um, the, the switch to the on the commercial bank side would not necessarily require board approval. Staff can manage that. But since the line of credit is uh, officially a large loan, um, that does require board approval. But the two uh, relationships go hand in hand. If we, if we move to a new bank for our line of credit, it would be a condition of that that we also move our commercial bank account. Uh, you can see the main reasons here on the slide. Um, it's both financial and uh, quality of service and breadth of services that the bank offers. Uh, the terms are, in the long run, better. Uh, so I don't view this as a controversial uh, decision point, but I would be open to any questions people have before considering it and voting on it. Any downside? Well, like upside, upside, upside to me, but yeah. yeah. Not really. There's a, in the first year, the fee will be slightly higher, but within a year or two, that will pay back, and I'll, I'll upside from there. And Mark has been talking to these guys for a long time. Yeah. These relationships have built over time. Does it get any better than prime plus zero? <laughs> I have not seen better than that. I'll keep looking. No, someday, zero. someday we'll go. Zero, zero, zero is good. Zero is good. I would also say, um, you know, I, I come from the finance world. I've worked for Schwab for many years. We traded many people to the first Republic Bank. Everyone I know who's gone over there, like, loves working for that company. They feel really good about the values and the ethics and the sort of the uh, the way that they do business as well, I've been trying to get my phone. <laughs> so, I mean, it's definitely something to, um, I mean, besides the fact that I think all of the um, attributes are really good, I feel very comfortable going with that first. Yeah. So the proposal is in the packet um, with the details to be summarized here, and I would love to get a, a board motion and approval for me to move forward and carry out all the paperwork that we fill alongside this. Do you want three separate votes here? Um, we do mine as well and only take a quick moment. Yeah. Oh, then we should have a, is it on the 
on the line of credit specifically? The finances are uh, Do we know if it's related specifically so to the line of credit? It's really not affected the other. Is there any other people? Oh, John? Sí, sí. Oh, you, uh, we can say that so you can see the 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 second topic that I want to talk about is budget planning for next year. There isn't a, an action item here, but I did want to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions, to get an update on where we are in the planning, because in our next meeting you will be seeing a full budget and we'll be under a bit of time pressure at that point to approve it. And I don't want to leave you in a position feeling like you haven't had a chance to give input or um, members of the public, etc. Um, so this is more of an update. Um, I'm uh, going to assume that you've read the items in the packet, so I'll go through relatively quickly. The first slide just reminds you of our overall budget planning cycle and where we are, which in this time frame is really working with the school teams to understand what they are asking for and to give some parameters around what's the art of the possible in terms of the funding landscape. Uh, I won't go through this one in detail, Can, do you, but can, yes? Are you open to a little yes. feedback maybe? Um, I, where in this process is the detailed enrollment analysis and goal setting happening to you? Next slide. Yeah. Um, so specifically when we talk about the revenue forecast, one of the critical uh, elements is the enrollment planning. So if you look at the key revenue drivers, enrollment is the number one revenue driver. And so when I'm talking to the schools about where their enrollment is likely to be and building my revenue forecast, there's a, an explicit assumption with them of how many students they're going to have each grade uh, in order for me to build the revenue forecast that then drives the parameters of what they can afford expense wise. Is that the enrollment target revisited during the process? Between now and June, yes. Specifically in cases where school leaders are feeling like they want to be able to afford more and are struggling to afford what they want in the budget, we iterate back around and there's a conversation that typically says, that's what you can afford with that many students, but if you were open to taking more students, there would be more money available to fund whatever that thing is they might be looking at. And we're not at that point right now. Right now it's looking like they can afford what they want to afford with the current enrollment. So we haven't gone back and pushed for an increase. Uh, I was talking to the person who said that they were responsible for the, uh, the enrollment, mm -hmm. or at least the, the projected enrollment and picking a new folks. And, and so when, when site leaders are telling you what they anticipate, what's that based on besides current students moving up because you have some data that shows that certain percentage of kids are not retained in the loss of the And the numbers that are coming in are based on folks who have actually uh, signed some documentation that they're interested in coming in. 
So is that the underlying data that they use? I, I want to, it's really kind of following up on that. As a principal, I always wanted my like more money. You know, yeah. I was protected more enrollment than, than the network office said. And we'd argue about it. Sometimes yeah. I was right more myself than I wasn't. <laughs> so it's really based on three things. So at a, at, a, at a first and foremost letter, it's based on class sizes and grades we serve and that kind of puts a practical threshold. So for example, uh, in kindergarten at Beta Academy we have we are currently planned for four cohorts of uh, uh, of kindergartens, four classrooms of kindergartens. Uh, and the question is are we looking at class sizes of 24, 25, 26, like how much room is there? Um, and we do that both uh, uh, at both schools across all grades. And the, the cohort sizes, the class sizes in the older schools uh, has been an interesting dynamic where, you know, the question is whether we would mirror the district and go to 32, 33 <coughs> size classes or try and stay at the 24, 25, 26 range that we tend to see in elementary. And at what grade does that happen? Does that happen in fifth grade or sixth grade or seventh grade? So overall capacity is the first piece. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to remind you, but I... Yep. The second piece is uh, around uh, intent to return. So we've surveyed all of our students at this point and asked whether they intend to return. And we know which percentage and which specific numbers by grade, by school, are saying they're going to return. We've also looked at last year's intent to return and how many of those kids actually did return. So we have a reasonable... On. How much of a haircut we expect from there? So I was, sh I was shocked, say, but we yeah. really did. We went back and looked at it. Yeah. So it, uh, it, the, there's slight differences across the schools. There's slight differences in grade spans, but we're factoring in that intent to return statement. And then what's left is okay. If we thought we could fill, say, a hundred kids in a certain grade, and we have ninety kids who say they're coming back, then we're looking at how many applicants we have how large our wait list is. And we've actually made offers to fill those seats. But we also know that since not all those offers will be accepted, we're looking at how much residual wait list there is. And in all grades except eighth grade at beta and TK at beta, TK which is a brand new grade for us, and eighth grade which is always the challenge at Richmond, we can fill whatever seats we want. There's zero concern. Um, and we could share the numbers. And you, what you'll see is that between the intent to return, the offers already made and accepted, and the residual wait list, there's a huge cushion of comfort. In eighth grade, we have enough students who said they're coming back and offers that have been made and accepted to fill the class, but our residual wait list is only 10 kids. So if a bunch of kids don't show up, that is where we will have some enrollment risk. But all of that is going on with me and Old Face Alley when she comes back, working with Francis and Kenya, the office lead for both sides, to really understand how they manage that, to make sure that they can be where they want to be. And, and just to add from a policy perspective, we are losing kids in a few grades because they're going to charter schools that have high schools. So there are, whether it's Aspire that's 612, um, Summit is 712, Making Waves is 512. So we, we know, parents tell us, that they're going to take their child out and that's where they're going. So we, we backfill. We backfill. Um, I, I have to say, we, we really think hard about backfilling in eighth grade. It's very challenging, but we have taken a small number of kids. So, so I think Marcus and his guy, his team, have been really good at estimating what demand is going to be and ensuring that we are covered. And I think, unfortunately, what we showed in February didn't we didn't have this explanation about the fact that the shift was actually a policy decision, not the fact that not enough kids showed up. But, so I guess I want to push on one thing because in a world in which we are not yet financially sustainable, yep. okay, some of this doesn't resonate with me because what we're in right now is I will have the fewest amount of kids I can have in my school to run the program I want to run. 
in a world in which we're not financially sustainable. And it, well, to be, to, uh, just, yeah, no, please, 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 please push on me. At, what we have said is that we have fundraised philanthropically to support growth of schools until they fall. So beta, which actually has a reserve, but does not need philanthropic support right now. Yeah. Change makers has not yet filled. We agreed to a longer run period, and we had to raise more money, which we did. So they are they are absolutely requiring philanthropic support to cover, but it's on agreed schedule. And as Marcus says in a very polite way, I think the school leaders are knowing that, hey, if I have ten more kids, I can do some of these things. So, so that that's we're massaging that, but they're going to have. There's 700 this year, roughly. Next year, there'll be 750. Yeah. So, so they still have some room to run, but it's not that far. Right. You're absolutely right that we don't have enough seats to fully support the central team. Right, which is, which is the whole, but I think we, we need more school to be blunt. I don't think we could add enough bodies. We, even if we had all of our authorized seats in full, Marcus, tell me if I'm wrong, we still wouldn't generate enough management fee to cover all our deficit at the center. Correct. Well, what I would say to you is it's incredibly difficult to break even at a, a system-wide without being fully maxed out yep. at every grade level. Yep. Fair enough. And so what I'm saying is when I hear the process, the dynamic, I think, having done this, the dynamic I think it causes is the inverse dynamic that I think you need and would want in the long run. Yep. Which is, I'm not trying to have this, I'm not always trying, I'm not in a tug of war about enrollment. I see enrollment as the fuel to this organization and also what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to serve as many kids as we possibly can. And if we've got kids on a wait list and not full classrooms, what are we doing? And we know the work's harder and we know all this. So I just, I think, I think the process to me leads to a dynamic between school leaders and the finance people. And I think in the long run, it will be very hard to break even with 2x the amount of schools and 3x the amount of schools, and what I know about this. So, so I wonder if there's a way to shift how we talk about enrollment. That's not like the necessary evil almost, <laughs> but the fuel and our commitment to the communities that we're in. I think uh, the only nuance that I would add, because I think that's all accurate, and I don't disagree with that. I think the nuance is uh, twofold. One is Vallejo. So Richmond is arguably fully enrolled. So for example, they're accepting 100 plus kids in kindergarten, which is 25 to 1 class sizes in a district where the district goal was 24 to 1, and our original goal was 24 to 1. So they're already over enrolled by a couple kids in every grade, in every class. And at the middle school, similarly. So they're, they're, they're accepting 96 to 100 kids in a three cohort model, where they're now going to have 32, 33 kids per class. So the issue in Richmond isn't any aversion. The school leaders aren't trying to accept fewer kids, other than this issue of, is it really wise to accept kids in eighth grade who are just going to be here for a year and gone? Budgeted for 790 we have. So did you 
So, and I think I'm reading this right. And 715 we budgeted for, and 688 we have. Yep. So either the budget was developed wishfully, thinkfully, which I've done so many times in my life, like how are we gonna change this budget deficit? We're gonna pretend like it's gonna happen during a moment. Or there's something that yeah. doesn't I, I think actually the thing that's- uh, Maybe I just need to know the no, details no, no, I think, and I can get off of it. No, 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 I think the, the, dis, the disconnect of any is that like, to be honest, I don't care about enrollment. Yeah. I care about ADA. Yeah. And so when we sat down in the summer and said, can I accept 10 fewer kids? Yeah. I said, yeah, I've padded the ADA number. I'm comfortable. Okay. Okay. We're, we're still going to hit our ADA target. And, and that's what you see. The enrollment is lower, the ADA is actually higher than the projection. That's all I care about. This, the focus that says, well, get the enrollment in the ADA, we'd be better off if there is a shift to it. And I think that's a shift that we're sort of pushing forward with having us go out to board meetings to say to school leaders, okay, this year when we say we're Two years back. Okay, so it's, it's understandable then that yeah. doing the home is going to be higher spending teachers here this year. Yep. Uh, also, the, the, the it was, there was a, and there was a fair amount of ex extra expense that came with that too in terms of signing bonuses and recruiting efforts and things like that that we would like to ease ourselves out of over time. Um, so that's where those first two lines come from. The third line is very different, it's what Jen said. We've known all along that at 10,000 in revenue per student and 1,000 of that coming to the central office, the central office is only going to be sustainable and we have somewhere around 3,000 or 4,000 students. So no amount of enrollment at beta or change makers is going to solve that. Right now we're going to need to and want to open additional schools and expand. Um, 
Jen and I have talked about a $900,000 deficit this year as being about right stage-wise and affordable from our confidence level of fundraising and prudent relative to our reserves. If for some reason that fundraising doesn't come in, it's not going to break the bank in a year. We can, you know, we'll, we'll have to adjust, obviously. But that's where that number comes from. It's not as precise as the school level numbers, which are very specifically tied to the economics of the schools. So I have a question, though. Yep. As we add more schools, is, do we not see the same need to add staff to the SSO? It won't be linear. So, for example, uh, you know, twice as many schools won't be two Ricks and two Marcuses, and you know, but you will have an extra talent associate. You probably need some extra help on the operational front, maybe a full-time accountant instead of a part-time accountant. But the marginal impact will be net positive uh, to scaling and increasing scale. We're probably right now staffing the point where we can handle. Um, we could probably handle twice as many students with two or three individual level additional contributors um, without necessarily needing extra layers of executive oversight. We've staffed most of the executive level functions pretty, pretty much across, but a lot of us are doing a fair amount of individual level contributor work right now that at scale we would hire a few more people and fill the team in and, and be able to delegate more of that. Excuse me, what's the SSO mean? And SSO stands for School uh, Support Office. That's the central office. There's no more the CMO? It's the same thing, but it's a different name. Yeah, we wanted to signal, this is a change we made last year, because we really wanted to signal that our role is to support the schools as opposed to be, you know, puppet master directing everything. So there isn't anything to vote on at this moment, but if, you, if there is feedback on these targets, if you want to call them that, um, that they feel imprudent, either on the, on the side of, boy, we're being penny-wise and pound foolish, or on the side of, wow, that's a scary big deficit, I'd like to see it lower, helpful to know that now as we go into planning. But if this is directionally reasonable, we'll continue and we'll be coming back with a more detailed budget proposal at the next meeting. And our school leaders are, are on board with this? Yeah. They understand it. They're, you know, they don't love it. I mean, they would love to have the money. They, 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 there's, I'm not getting pushback or fights or, like, this is crazy or unethical or whatever. They're, they're sort of working within this framework. Okay. Um, uh, not worth going into these details other than to say if you do read anything either after the meeting or whatever, you can always send me a note and I can give you more color commentary, more detail. The next steps are just to, as I said, to kind of continue to iterate with uh, the schools. Uh, to your point, Carolyn, revalidating the enrollment assumptions is one of the key things that we're going to just really hit the nail on the head. Um, and then in particular, uh, you know, the staffing plan right now at Beta feels aligned with where we need to be. The staffing plan at Changemakers is a little tight. And so we are going back and forth and trying to work through that and looking at non-staff assumptions and everything else. Uh, and by the way, both schools are having town hall meetings to talk with parents and staff to get feedback on LCAP goals. All the normal things that you're used to hearing us talk about that is also happening. Beta has one tomorrow night, I believe. Um, I guess I, we can, th this does not require a vote. Yeah. I'm, no. I'm concerned about the time. Yep. And so if we can move to the one that requires yep. action. I'm going to do that right now. So the one that does require action um, in particular is the first of these three facility updates. Um, so uh, as you've all uh, heard about before and are listening to right now, um, you know, one of the big challenges we have here at this facility, uh, of all the great things about it, one of the challenges is that upstairs, there's a lot of echoey open space. And there's a whole history about how we ended up in that boat. And some of it has to do with how we manage the project and a certain mea culpa on my side, as we've talked about before, where we jump forward a little faster. 
Some of it was related to building codes. The good news uh, in all this is that the building codes have changed to a degree that it now allows us to do something that we weren't able to do before around subdividing some of these bigger open spaces into more traditional classroom layouts that the school team will feel much more comfortable with. Um, we've had an architect doing some drawings and investigating this with the city of Vallejo in terms of code and life safety and all those sorts of things. Uh, and we're at a point where uh, I feel like there's a good project that makes a lot of sense that we want to do with the school team here. Um, the thing that is interesting about this project is because this building is actually owned by a different landlord, um, and because our supporting organization, Calgary's Bay Real Estate, actually has the option to take over the building and, and own it in the long run, which is, is our plan, um, there's a little bit of a nuance over, even if you love this project, how are we going to execute it? And the recommendation on the table is to have Calgary's Bay Real Estate, which is our supporting organization whose mission is to support our facility efforts, be the one who does the project so that when they buy the building out and they're the full owners of the building, they will also own these improvements. Uh, it has a side benefit for the school of not having to um, sort of uh, pay for and, and, and lose the financial flexibility of uh, you know, the upfront cost of it, they would instead pay for it over the next 30 years, the same way they're paying for the building over the next 30 years through a lease. Um, uh, the challenge with that structure, which uh, it, uh, is uh, that I'm trying to solve for, is that, that Calgary's Bay Real Estate doesn't have the cash right now to do the project because they are not yet buying out the building and doing all the financing related with the building. And so what uh, PCSD and our attorneys uh, and our financial advisors have all recommended is that we loan the money to Calgary's Bay Real Estate. They would do the improvements, and then once the improvements are done and they buy back the building, they would be paid a lot. There's a little bit of risk, of course, that something goes completely haywire and we make a loan and they make the improvements and uh, you know, they don't repay the loan. But frankly, that's no worse than if we just pay for it ourselves and something like that. You know, it's not a different nature of risk. Um, Yeah, it's called a reimbursement resolution is what it's called. So that when we issue the bonds, we would be reimbursed for the money that we put out up front. Okay. And so those those are the two items you're Those would be the two items. Yes. Did she, her public comment, refer to this? No. Uh, it had to ignore Prop 51, I thought. No, it was, uh, well, this is all financial and uh, 
familias estén, estén informadas. ¿Cuánto dinero se va, se va a agarrar de becas o de grants, como le llamen? ¿Y cuánto dinero ustedes um, van a tener que pagar porque son préstamos? Um, so I think it's important that parents are made aware of how much money for this project will be taken from grants and how much will come out of loans and like will have to be paid from your part. Okay. Eh, but no por ellos, sino que se van a pagar por los niños. Yeah. Se van a pagar con el dinero de los niños. And how much money, if any, will be taken away from like the kids in the process of doing this? Entonces, la, la cosa más importante aquí es que las familias entiendan que estas escuelas, no sé si eventualmente aquí en Vallejo van, van a ser para las familias de, de Vallejo um, y que las familias estén informadas que, que estas escuelas son prestadas. And I think it's uh, an important topic to discuss with the families that they understand that, mm -hmm. I don't know if at some point these schools will belong to the families, the communities, but they need to understand that right now, like these school grounds are borrowed. Es un préstamo. Eso es lo que yo entiendo. No sé si es like a loan. It's like borrowed out right now. That's what I understand. Pero no sé si eventualmente van a ser de la familia. Por ejemplo, no creo, ¿verdad? Porque son del distrito. Este, entonces, que tengan en cuenta y que informen a las familias cuánto dinero se está gastando, cuánto se está prestando, cuánto va a ser regalado. Um, so I think it's important that we keep in mind, um, because these schools are borrowed, they don't belong to the families yet, and I'm not sure if they will belong to the families, but it's important to let the families and communities know how much money is being used, how, many lo how much in loans are coming out, and how much Uh, money is being lost in the process of doing these things. Y también siempre tengamos en cuenta que la transparencia y contabilidad es algo que necesitamos 
tener más en cuenta. Also, uh, keep in mind that transparency and accountability is something that we need to keep in mind more often. Entonces, las familias en veces nos olvidamos de, de formarnos más porque, pues queremos solo, confiamos, confiamos en las, en las escuelas autónomas, que son las charters. Um, so sometimes families don't make a lot of effort to be a part of the decision making that is taking place uh, because we like just confide that the right decisions are being made. Entonces, um, seamos más transparentes y contables uh, para que todas las familias, no todas, las que quieran y tengan la información, puedan, um, puedan entender por cómo se hacen las escuelas, cómo se construyen, qué códigos ustedes usan también para que sean unas escuelas seguras. Obviamente que este edificio es seguro, pero obviamente que no sé si fue construido con código de construcción de escuela o código de oficina. Uh, so it's important to be uh, transparent about how you're building these schools, what codes you're uh, adhering to. If it's like a school code a building, if you're following school code, like building structures, or if you're uh, following like building, like office uh, building codes, uh, it's important to relay that information back to the family. Entonces eso no sabemos, ¿verdad? Este solo ustedes lo saben, los que están construyendo, los diseñadores. Entonces nosotros las familias no, no sabemos. Gracias. Um, so these are things that only the board or uh, the board knows, and so it's something that needs to be relayed really back to the parents. Okay. So are there any, any questions from the board? Any other questions? Okay. If not, then I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the uh, spending of the five hundred thousand dollars to update the uh, second floor and the resolution. Uh, the loan to Seabree and the reimbursement resolution. The loan to Seabree and the reimbursement resolution. In the interest of time, I think we can. Um, skip over the last update, which was just going to be just having you updated on the progress towards North Campus. That's going to come up more in the June meeting, but be sure to read through that and a lot of exciting stuff. The school team has been really engaged. Uh, it's been really fun. Can you in three minutes or less? Just, I mean, yeah, just for the time. Yeah, like, what's yeah. the next step? Yeah, so, uh, so our goal is to be in front of the district in June with a complete set of schematics, uh, some elevations, floor plans, videos that show the site so that the board can give their approval. Um, one of their rights in the agreement with them is that uh, because we're building this on their site, they wanted to have approval over the, the foundational design. Um, they're not going to get involved in every last piece of it, but they wanted to know that up front that it was going to be a, a school they could be proud of and happy with. So we're trying to get on board schedule in June um, and bring that to them.
I know you've done stuff already. We have. We've had a couple events on the site already in terms of uh, a neighborhood meeting. We've engaged with the uh, Little, League, uh, Little League League that uses the fields there and are very active community members involved. Um, and so far, we have not seen any uh, resistance. Um, I don't want to pretend that there isn't going to be some at some point along the way. But we've been trying really hard to get out and meet people and make sure people have that opportunity that if they do have concerns, they can bring them to us and we can try and resolve them um, rather than sort of finding out about the last minute, being upset, running the board, et cetera. So we're trying very hard to do that. Um, one of the challenges is that particular neighborhood is not tightly mobilized and organized the way some other neighborhoods are. So there are a lot of really active groups that you could say, hey, you're meeting every week. Can I pop in on any meetings and give you a presentation? It doesn't seem to exist. We've, we've reached out to uh, Supervisor Joya's office since it's in the county, not the city, and asked his staff for advice about which groups are active in that neighborhood and who should we talk to. Um, uh, there hasn't been much. Which, but just show me yeah. where the swing of the board's oh. chair is. Um, <laughs> you, you can all of it. You can, there's this, we're going to put a chair out here on the soccer field. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll what name you it you like. Jose Lopez <laughs> referee chair. Well, I won't be the chair then. But <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> Yeah. 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 All right, so let's. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you for that. That's it. All the stuff. Okay. So, so I'm gonna jump back up to the most important part. Not that this is unimportant. Is what Rick has to say in terms of our our looking at academic achievement and where we're headed and what how we're doing. So, yeah. Rick, I know the time is short. I mean, yeah. the time is late. It's not short. It's late. <laughs> so take whatever time you need to be able to do this so that we can be fully informed. Okay, great. Well, thank you. My name is Rick Zappa, and I'm the Chief Schools Officer for the camera. Um, not much to inform you about since our, our last meeting in February, but I just want to update you on a couple of things. That for the first time, um, all of our students have taken the interim uh, comprehensive assessment test, the ICAs. Um, and that has been um, a really good resource for our teachers to to use in terms of analyzing and looking at what can be what they could focus on between now and the SBAC test in a few weeks. Actually, um, the test. Um, the tests were taken in February. They were graded uh, soon after, and uh, we've been spending much of March and the first part of April kind of looking at the data and um, working through our professional learning communities to address some of the, the issues. Um, the, the real update is just to bring you up to speed on some of the initiatives that the ed team um, and the school leaders have been focusing on in, in the last few months, actually, which you should be aware of, but I'm just bringing up to date on what's happening. You may remember that we've spent uh, most of this year aligning on two initiatives. Um, the Calvert School Vision for Instructional Excellence and the Leadership Excellence Review. They're separate initiatives, but they are de directly related to one another. So the first is the framework for equitable instructional excellence. The, the focus last month has been to gather our school leaders um, to look at what has actually been done over the caliber pillars, caliber values, the mission statement, as well as the caliber graduate profile. The four school leaders, created what we call three belief statements around culturally relevant These are the um, indicators that we came up with. Um, and I'll just give you a minute to look at them.
these we believe statements and we started to narrow down, become more explicit about um, how these would live in our systems and our policies and in our classrooms. Um, and some of the headings, indicators that we came up with included classroom environment, approaches to different learning styles, and uh, student choice. Far too many to name here, but we broke up in four groups and we have pages of, of descriptions of what this might look like in our classrooms. Um, our next step for this month is to draft and share the strategic plans of each school using our we believes around culturally relevant pedagogy connected to our LPAC goals. So we're try uh, LCAP goals. So we're trying. Oh, we're, we're we try do have LPAC goals too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we're trying to um, align all of these documents into one. Um, so. Um, even though each school has different characteristics, different strengths, uh, and challenges, we're expecting that those strategic plans will be more aligned than before. So, that's the question. Uh, I'm thinking of our realm, in, in the policy realm, yeah. and how we can look at these and create policies that will help to everyone to understand these are not uh, just good ideas. These are policies. So Caliber 4 has looked at it. It was developed collaboratively from, from the school sites, not, it wasn't our stuff. And if we then, and if you would guide us in developing policies that would support and enforce as necessary, any of these, but also the, this policy drives our finances. It should. It should also drive our hiring decisions. It should drive our structure. It should drive our processes. Any number of different areas. And if you look at it holistically, how a policy should permeate an organization and the, being developed the ground up, I really think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to look at. Because we're, while we do have some policies, we're not really, you know, policy driven as much as we probably should be that could help us, the organization, you know, have, have visible documents of what we believe and what, how it should happen and how it should be structured. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Jose, in that when this, the second document that I'm, I'm going to talk about in a moment is the leadership excellence rubric, on that, it, it includes talent. You know, it, it, it includes hiring. Um, what are the actions that an excellent leader would do within the, within the organization, right? And that should be pervasive through school, starting at the SSO level, right? It's for all of us, and that it's the accountability piece. Right? Where does our commitment and belief in grade level rigor in the Common Core standards show up. Should it show up in here? Yes, it absolutely does, should. Where, where does it show up in here in your mind, in the organization's mind? Well, uh, I think it would, it'll show up in the materials, the, the, um, the, the culturally relevant materials that we put in front of kids. It's not that the rigor changes, it's that the, the, we're putting things in front of kids that interest them. So we're approaching it from um, um, a, a kind of strategic and thoughtful approach to what makes kids want to learn. Right? What interests them? And, and they're part of this process. You know, their voice is in this as well. And that's why part of this is having one of the, the indicators was giving students choice. So students may have choice. It's not like you can't do homework, but they may have choice in the homework that they get to do. Right? It's not that they don't take, uh, that they don't have projects, but they have choice in the projects that they do. That is standards-based. That is common core. 
Um, and, and that's the alignment piece. That's non-negotiable, right? So to me, it was noticeably absent. So I just want to say, like, we have like 20 belief statements here, and there's not a single one that talks about grade level rigor and college common core standards. Mm -hmm. And from my experience with this, I've done similar exercises where it's not showed up. And what people said to me, assured me, oh, that's just a given. Mm -hmm. OK? Yeah. And it's not just a given. And so I, w I, I encourage you, and I'm thinking about all the conversations you've even had today with CEO candidates about yes. what are we yeah. stating? What are, we're taking a stand on a lot of things yeah. here. And, um, and we're not taking a stand on that in my mind. And if it's not going to show up here, I don't know how it's going to show up in everything else. In your rubrics and leading for excellence does show up. Uh, can you be for excellence and not be getting grade level proficiency? Yeah. 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 So, so I just yeah, but it does it does show up there. It, it does show up when we took this. This was what we started with. Our next step was actually going into the we we researched several different leadership rubrics from across the country, including Denver Public Schools, new leaders, and a few others. We actually landed on the one that CMA has developed, which is a compilation of many other rubrics. But it's very clear that the standards based learning and um, assessment, alignment around assessments, it, it's in that rubric. Do you feel like this is missing from these? Like what I'm just bringing up, or it doesn't feel, it feels like... I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I think that is one thing that was concerning. I mean, I was trying to read through and I was like, well, I guess where it says you believe in responsibility, you teach in such a way that all students do that. Maybe that gets to that point, but I, I think there could be a little bit more specificity that goes into these statements, and I think in particular, as, as we discussed, as you said, it's been, uh, it's been coming up a lot with the interviews with the CEO candidates, is, you know, we need to have what we're about, or is that what we're not yeah. about? Is it possible to put that explicitly in here? The, for sure. I, I, I really believe that it will be in the final product. This was a brainstorm. Uh -huh. right? So can we just stick on this? So yeah. is it concerning to you? that in a brainstorm of the folks that are in front of our kids, leading our schools and others, that it has not come up as one of 20 beliefs. It doesn't address what we teach. It addresses how we teach, what we believe about kids, what we believe about kids equity and families and so forth, but it does not address specifically well, one we teach, and I don't mean by topic area, or, but just that the standards, common core, grade level, whatever that is, because you may, that may be where you're finding the resistance of, of folks mm -hmm. as you, I know you've been more trying to really mm -hmm. infuse standards-based instruction in, these, in our schools. Mm -hmm. And if we can support, we support that. The question is, can we support it in ways that are much more feasible, maybe even a little bit more explicit. Explicit, explicit, yeah, thank you. And not to take away from this work, because this is a great piece of work that has a lot of, uh, you know, important pieces that I think are about it, you know. It's just thinking, like you said, from, uh, you know, and I, I think all of these are really important and really important things that we want to include in the education. It's just at the end of the day, it's school, right? And parents are sending their kids to the school in order to learn and grow and achieve and move on to whatever they're doing. And, and ultimately, we want everyone to succeed in this back, whether that's a good indication of grade standards or not. You know, ultimately, we want everyone to be in our school to be able to succeed and hit those academic standards. And I think all of this will feed into that, but I do think that it is something we should very explicitly state out to our community. What, how would you state it? Because we believe what that all kids are capable of doing great level rigorous work in all subject matters every day. <laughs> I would say I don't know. I, you know oh. But like that's how strong it would be, right? Like yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like what are we batting around? Like what are we trying to I would say what you just asked us is a little unfair because we didn't do this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
I would say you take our comments and our sentiment and go back, not necessarily to, to, the, to this, but to some way to understand. The board really wants, the board believes, the community wants. We are judged by, we are judged by, so our black and brown kids are not going to be judged by as back yes they are, whether we want them to or not, whether we believe in it or not. So <laughs> we want to make sure this is explicitly known to our leaders and to our teachers and everyone that mm -hmm. we're committed to all students being taught at grade level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good feedback. Yeah. But I think that, that what I would say to you is I think there's something here that's yeah. part of what the struggle is either with change management or the decisions. Because if you believe in that, there's a whole bunch of practices we probably need to shift in the coming years. And those practices are really hard to shift. And so if you don't really believe in that, you have no hope in, sh in shifting practices that are really hard to shift. So, Getting people on the bus that don't really believe in that, they believe in other things, but they don't believe in that, and then trying to make the shift is like shying away from making sure we have the right people that believe in that is only going to cause us, I think, in my mind, not to be successful at achieving it. Yeah. Just like whistling in the wind for a period of time. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I yeah. always read this as SEL yeah. without without the instruction. Mm -hmm. Even though you have culturally relevant pedagogy, you're still not talking about content and, and what we what we what our kids should be learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that enough for <laughs> enough for feedback yeah, yeah, on this one? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, you have you want to run through other pieces of this week or not? Um, no, the, the other piece is the leadership excellence rubric that we've been working on. Um, and again, we're not sure if it's a, a rubric or we're not sure what it is, but we're, you know, we're in the process of describing it, what it looks like, feels like, sounds like yeah. right now. Um, and, and there's that, some good resources. It sounds like you guys yeah. are trying to reinvent the wheel. And yeah, you're we're actually out. not trying to reinvent yeah. it. We're just taking the best practices and best some of the best of everybody's world and, and rewriting it for us, thinking about the, the caliber uh, graduate profile. Uh, I've understood down. this past couple of days that a number of our leaders, school leaders and, and uh, SSL folks, have been to the, the KIPS Leadership Development Program? Yeah, a few have. And you may you know that one of our candidates actually created that program. I do. And so that's one of the, and not necessarily that we should because he was here, but that's already done. It's packaged. It's been proven. It's in Key State Town University. So, so and, and and as I've looked at it, I, I completely agree with with its its concept. It? So you may want to, because sometimes there's kinds of things as you develop internally or collaboratively, don't have the benefit of all the research of all the literature that is out there. Yeah. You know, and we've got some very young folks out there. Yeah. And the literature out there is rich around leadership development. Yeah, I mean, one of our school leaders here went through it. Yeah, because uh, she was talking yeah. Rachel, Rachel and her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I went through it. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Rachel. Yeah, thank you. So, are we? You, any other comments we don't I, need? I just what I I think it'd be hard to describe how challenging it is to actually get everybody at the table and get this out there. And while I share the concerns of the board about the explicit nature, the very first item on that list says, we believe our students, really, we value student success in mainstream society. And that is about testing. That's about. I don't know if it is or isn't. I, I know because I was in the room. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, people it, is. Yeah. it is. Yeah. But what I think what we're, we are, this is a change management process. Yeah. What we've learned the hard way is that if we, at the center, just stick something in front of folks, yeah. you know, we can run off the flagpole, but they're not going to salute it. And frankly, mm -hmm. I'd much rather know who really isn't on board <coughs> in this process 
so that we can make some changes. Because if the leaders aren't on board, I promise you the teachers aren't on board. So what Rick is trying to do, and this has been harder than anyone thought, is to basically say to the school leaders, okay, you can make this, you can drive this process, but we all have to agree on what the vision is, and it includes standards-based instruction and success on state testing. It's not the only measure, but it's an important measure. I think what else you're seeing here, for me this has been an important warning, is that the way to get to that is to marry culturally relevant pedagogy with SEL. That, you, 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 that actually the sort of old style 1.0 of everybody just do, you know, roll your times tables and whatever, that is not in fact <laughs> going to lead to all students achieving academically. So this has been really, really hard work, but I do think we're making progress toward the end that you guys, and we all, we all believe, but I think if we came in right now and said, hey, it's better say yeah. it, it ain't going to fly. So yes and, uh, we're hurting people um, to a place where if we get this right, this year for the first time, every, all three schools' strategic plans will include standards-based instruction as one of their target goals. And we've not had that before, which I know sounds crazy, but it's true. So for me, this is a huge win that actually everyone's in the room. We're identifying the folks who aren't on the bus, to use Carolyn's phrase. Um, and, and Rick is really masterfully leading that process in a way that I think has much more chance of sticking than just telling people that this has to be in your plan. Right. I, I guess what I would want to say is um, I agree with you. I don't think the answer is to go stick your own bullet up there because, like, forget about it. Right. Right. So they're like, great, yeah, sure, right. right. So I guess what I'm thinking about is there's something there, there around people's beliefs. And having lived this, there is. So for me, is like, how do we unlock the connection? How do we, but truly, have people truly believe it, not just like put the bullet there, but like, have, I don't know if there's stuff to read or see or watch or alums or like what is our parents or kids because I think this is the challenge is how do we unlock the connection between um, equity and grade level rigor and SEL because I think we're well and Rick has been I think very wise yeah he's you know because the school leaders here really really value Shrocky Holly, who yep. says exactly those things. Yep. That's the master text yep. we're using now. Right. So we come together once a month for a full day, it's next week, yep. and we read sections of the book, and that's exact. That's the process. Yep. So he is really living that, that change management piece. Um, and so I think for the first time, I understand yeah. why it hasn't worked before. Because if you don't come into it with those things, you can't communicate that to your staff. And you can't make the change. Yeah. And I say one other thing, sorry, is that I, I wonder if like the, the thread the needle is for for school leaders to realize like I would like to see this on here. Yeah. I don't want it on here until people actually believe it. But this is the this is what I believe as the chief schools officer, as the right. And so is it about saying this is what I would like to have be on here? And I understand if it were people, you know. I don't want it on there until people actually believe it. And so what's the process by which we grapple with that? Yeah, you, you bring up good points. And, and I'm thinking, why isn't it on here? And I wonder it's because there's the disconnect is not that they don't believe in it. It's yeah. they're not sure how to achieve it. And that's the process that we're in. And that I'm hoping by creating this leadership explicit document about what I as a leader should be doing in order for students to be successful, that that starts to help them feel more comfortable. We have some school leaders who absolutely know what it is and are doing it every single day. And we have some who are, and I'm saying some, I'm not going to put on some, but you know, who will say, I believe in it, but don't do it, not because they don't care. Right, well, because they don't know how. Yeah, totally agree. And so the how, I could tell them how, but that's my vision for how, and it's not going to fly. So, so, thank you for, for thanking this.
the sin folks because I commit, I consider ourselves part of the community. Uh, collectively and individually, we consider ourselves part of the, and this is the input that we've given yes. uh, to you, uh, and I agree completely. We're not saying we want another duck because they're, they're going to scratch that. Yeah. No, but I, I hear you, and, okay. and it's important for them to know what you think too, mm -hmm. right? That's important, and I will, I will be sure to take that back to the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I believe uh, where, where I am now with the agenda. Anybody realize where we are? We did have one public comment on the academic affairs. Academic affairs, okay. And then we are going to, if we still have time, to move into back to a closed session to continue our conversation about the, the, the CEO candidate. Okay, so if we did just... Kids are and how we can help in 
them succeeding academically. Uh, un punto que me llamó la atención de este de esta de estos puntos de valor que es el el no, no dice pero aquí donde dice que todos los los estudiantes tendrán éxito académico. Uh, one topic that I thought was important in the values was uh, the topic that stated that all students will have academic success. Entonces, um, ese es Ese es un gran, um, un gran compromiso que es, se va a hacer en equipo tanto de las escuelas como los padres y los alumnos. That's a, that's a big, that's a big promise that has to be made and followed through by the students, the board, and the parents. Y todos los que administran la escuela. And everyone who administers the school. Entonces, para mí es importante que Caliber no solo tenga esto en un papel. So for me, it's important that Caliber not only has these values on a paper. Porque sabemos, yo sé especialmente de una madre que Caliber le dijo que se fuera para el distrito porque no le podían servir a su hijo. Because I know specifically of a mother who was told by Caliber to go to a district school because Caliber couldn't uh, properly serve their child. Tenía necesidades especiales. And they had, uh, it was a child with special needs. En Caliber Richmond y en Caliber Vallejo hay cuatro, hay dos niños en Richmond y dos niños en Vallejo que están yendo a escuelas um, pagadas por Caliber porque no les pudieron dar um, el, el estudio que se merecía ese niño en Caliber. Um, so she knows that there's two students in Beta Academy and two in Changemakers that Caliber is paying for paying for them to attend other schools because Caliber didn't have like the academic grounds to be able to properly help. Them. Entonces, lo cual se me parece muy bien si esos niños necesitan otra escuela que le que que le esté um, dando los servicios, la educación que se merece está muy bien. Pero recordemos que no pueden solo estar diciéndole a la familia, oh, no podemos darles um, educación especial, váyanse a otras escuelas. And I agree that this is something uh, excellent to do, that if Caliber cannot help these students, that we send them somewhere else, but just remember that we can't keep pushing students out because Caliber uh, doesn't have like the grounds to be able to help them. Entonces, tengamos en cuenta, uh, muestren los exámenes estatales a los, a los, a los padres para que, uh, para que los padres sepan dónde están sus hijos y trabajen juntos. So it's important to show uh, the results for these state's exam to parents so that they know where their child uh, is standing academically. Gracias. Gracias. Okay, uh, and I was just reminded by my fellow board member here that there's still an item we have to review and approve. That's a consent item, uh, B1. So is there a motion then to approve the minutes of board minutes of meeting of two, uh, February 25th? I motion to approve the board minutes. Second. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. At this point, then, we're, the board is going to go into closed sessions, and we want to thank everyone for being here, and hope to see you again next time. Thank you so much.